Hello, I'm Reverend Michael Youngblood, Senior Pastor of Westover Baptist Church. I'm really glad that you're here with us today as we have come together to praise and worship God, to thank Him, to learn of Him. I'm glad that you're here. Do you have one of these things around your house? I think you take it and you point it at something and the expectation is when you press one of these buttons, something's going to happen. You have faith that it's going to happen. You don't look to check the batteries. You just pick it up, you point, and you press the button, right? That's an act of faith. Does God require faith of us in Him? What does the Bible say about faith? Do we really have to believe what we can't see? Join us. Stay with us. Be with us as we sing the hymns of Zion, as we talk about our walk with God through music. Join us in our corporate prayer as we pray to God, as we come together as a Christian community. And then join us in our sermon. Be there with us as we look to see what the Bible tells us about faith, what God expects of us when it comes to faith, and what we can expect of Him when we have faith. I'm glad that you're with us.
Good morning. Welcome to Westover Baptist Church and Worship Service. Thank you for being with us today. We're so grateful we could worship together even as we are not in the same space. We feel that God has his richest blessings for you as you view this service. We invite you to download the Worship Service Bulletin located on our homepage. Also, if you have a specific prayer request, please go to our homepage and click on the prayer button on the right-hand side of the page. We would love to pray for you, so we encourage you to make use of this opportunity and allow us to serve you in this way. Now, wherever you find yourself in life, we want this to be a worship experience you can depend on for receiving inspiration, encouragement, and support. Enjoy your worship service with us today, and God bless you. Our first hymn today is number 390, We Are Called to Be God's People. We are called to be God's people, showing by our lives His grace. One in heart and one in spirit, sign of hope for all the race. Let us show how He has changed us and remade us as His own. Let us share our life together as we shall around His throne. We are called to be God's servants, working in His world today, taking His own task upon us, all His sacred words obey. Let us rise into His summons, The COVID-19 pandemic has certainly changed each of our lives, and one of the ways it has made a significant change all around the world and here in the Arlington community is increasing the need for food assistance. We have partnered for a number of years with the Arlington Food Assistance Center, and typically we have food drives at least two times per year. The need is greater so we ask that you join us in supporting our neighbors in need and drop off canned goods and non-perishable foods that will be donated to the Arlington Food Assistance Center. The drop-off location is at the church, and the donation box is inside of Door 2 on the Patrick Henry Drive side of the building. We thank you for your support. Although we're not able to be on campus for worship service and for our other ministry activities, we do have ongoing expenses to maintain the building, support staff, and provide community support. We are grateful to those who have been able to continue to give during this time. It has been very helpful to us. 
we are providing several ways that you can give. You can give online or through our church website. If you go to our website, there is a button that is marked Give on the right-hand side of the home page. You can click that button and you are asked for particular information about your gift. You can set up your gift as a one-time gift or a recurring gift and then provide your banking information. Using your mobile phone, you can give by texting. Send a text to the number 73256. And then, in the body of the text message, you would type in capital W, capital C, capital A, lowercase r, lowercase l, and the amount of your gift and hit enter. Then a screen will come up and ask you for your banking or credit card information. You may also continue to mail your gift to the church. The mail is monitored daily or you may drop your gift off to the church and put it in the church office mail slot, which is the door between the flagpoles facing Patrick Henry Drive. Some of you may take advantage of online banking through your own bank and have the bank send a check through the mail. You may use any of these methods to provide your gift, and we sincerely appreciate your support. Thank you. Our scripture reading is titled, Trust is Faith in Action. It is taken from the New Testament book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, the 1st, 3rd, and 6th verse of the New Living Translation. Trust is Faith in Action. 
Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen, and it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Trust is faith in action. Please sing our next hymn, number 407, Because He Lives. sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my Savior as he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth. I pray that we can keep learning, whatever that looks like, and that we'll be together, even if it's in a whole new way. God, I pray as we step into the unknown future that you continue to show me things about myself and life, things I can't learn in books. Be with me, God, no matter how this year unfolds. Help us, God, to do our best every day. Even when every day isn't what we thought it would be. Keep us safe and keep us learning, one day at a time. Thank you, God. Amen. 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 I'm Michael Youngblood, Senior Pastor of Westover Baptist Church. We are blessed to be able to sing the hymns. I hope you joined with Ed and Nellie and Doug as we sang the hymns of Zion that talk about what God has done for us, his love for us and his concern.
just to touch on some just to touch on some of the things that's ahead the end of September we will celebrate our 81st anniversary Westover Baptist Church has served this community faithfully to teach and to preach about God and his love to benefit our community in all the ways that we could by donations of food and and help and support we are a community church so won't you join us the last Sunday of September as we celebrate 81 years of service. Do remember each Sunday from 930 to 1030 we have our adult Bible study and also our children's Bible study. If you go to our website you'll be able to find the information there that you can join us online. Our adult Bible study you can also join us in person so if you're in the area, I hope that you will be there with us. That's Sunday, each Sunday from 930 to 1030. I hope that you'll join us. Keep us in prayer as we will pray for you. I encourage you each week, go to our website. There's always things that we're putting there uh, to let you know of what's coming up with our church calendar, what we're doing, and also seek your input to offer our help to you. We are a community church. We're a church of God's people who loves God's people. I hope that you'll be with us. I believe there's a popular song named after a movie. It's called Ghostbusters. And the song says, who are you going to call? Well, in reality, I say, who are you going to call in a time of need? Who is it that you can depend on to be there, to hear your requests? To be there to support you, to console you, to comfort you, to give you his peace. It's God. And while we are encouraged and instructed by the Bible to pray individually, we are also to pray as a community. And we come together on each of our worship services to pray together as a Christian community. Won't you join me in prayer now as we go before our God? Dear Lord, First, we say thank you for all that you have done in our lives. If we counted our blessings, if we named them one by one, they truly would be too many to enumerate. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your son, Jesus the Christ, who gave his life for the remission of our sins, for the forgiveness of what we have done against your will. We say thank you, dear Lord. And Lord, you know where we are in our lives. You know the good and you know the bad. You know when we've been faithful to you to do what you have asked. And you know when we've done our own thing. So we ask for forgiveness, Lord, when we have been unfaithful to you. When we've gone contrary to what you have told us to do. And we're thankful the confidence that we have in your word. That you said that if we would confess our sins, our transgressions, our wrongs, that you would be faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. If we would repent and say, I'm sorry, you'll forget and forgive. You said it would be in your memory as far as the east is from the west, which is saying you would not remember. So forgive us, dear Lord. And then, dear Lord, we pray for our world. Truly, it seems that everywhere we turn to look, there's turmoil, there's trouble, there's chaos. But, Father, we ask that you would bring peace. We, bring, we pray, Lord, for our brothers and sisters in Haiti who are suffering from natural disasters, Lord, and political turmoil. Bring peace to the people, dear Father. And then, Lord, use us to share our abundant blessings with others that they may have. Father, we pray for those in Afghanistan and the situation there, Lord. We pray for peace. Give our leaders wisdom, dear Lord. We pray for our men and women who are putting their, li their lives on the line. We pray for their protection. We pray, Lord, for the safety of all. 
Lord, we pray for those who are suffering from the disease known as COVID-19. Father, we know that you're able to rid us of this plague. Father, help us to do our part, what we're supposed to do, Lord, to help this situation. I pray, Lord, for those who may have contracted disease, that you will bring relief from pain, that you will bring recovery. Where we stand in need, we will trust you, Lord, to provide. Because you said you would not fail us. You said that you would provide for our needs. Increase our faith and our trust in you. And Lord, whatever the situation is in our life, we give it to you. We lay it at your feet, trusting you not to pick it up and take it back with us, not to worry about it, but we will trust you. We pray this prayer in Jesus name. Amen. What does it mean to be a Christian? One of the key characteristics of a Christian is faith. But let's talk about that for a bit. What does that mean? How do we have faith? Where do we get faith? How do we exercise our faith? I'd like to call your attention to 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter and the seventh verse. In total, we've looked at the 6th and the 7th verse, but for your reading, I would like to read the 7th verse. For we walk by faith and not by sight. I'd like to add to that Proverbs, the 16th chapter and the 9th verse. People plan their path, but the Lord secures their steps. Some of you may recognize this thing. We place a lot of faith in this device that we use. I think even to the degree of maybe not realizing just how much. If you don't recognize it, it's an alarm clock. And you may use your phone now. You may use some electronic device, but this goes back a little ways. You wind it up. You set the time, you set the time that you want it to, to alarm, put it on the shelf or whatever beside you on, on the stand beside the bed. Then you go to sleep, trusting that at the right time, you'll hear that and you will wake up and then begin your day. That's a lot of faith and trust. You know why I say that? First, this is mechanical. So you have to have faith and trust that at the proper time, it will alarm and tell you it's, it's, it's sounding to let you know it's, it's time. It's time to get up. Mechanically, you've, you've put faith and trust in this device. Then a great deal of faith that you're putting out is that you're going to hear it, that you're going to be able to hear it. You know, the alarm clock isn't really what wakes us up because if that was the case, I could take this out to the cemetery and let it ring. But I don't think those who are asleep and rest there will wake up. So there's, so there's a degree of faith in the device and in our ability to respond. That's one example of faith. But let's look and see how faith in God is important for the Christian. Let's see what God says about it. Let's see what God requires of us when it's concerning faith. It seems simple, but it's critically important. So let me start by beginning to say who God is. God can do anything. God can do anything. 
Some will add God can do anything but fail. He can do anything he wants, but he cannot fail. Others may add God can do anything, but he cannot lie. So if we read it in the Bible, what God has said, you could take it to the bank. God does not lie. And, and that's true. He's faithful and he's just. But you know what I like to say? I like to say about God what he said to Moses. So picture, Moses has been wandering around in the desert tending sheep. All of a sudden he sees a bush that catches on fire, which in that type of environment, in a desert environment, is not really uncommon. But what he noticed about this bush is that it was not consumed by the fire. And so he drew near to observe what was happening. And then he hears God's voice. This says, Moses, you are standing on holy ground. Take your shoes off. I want you to reverence and respect where you are right now. And so God tells Moses, I want you to go to Egypt. I want you to return there. And I want you to tell Pharaoh to let my people go, free them from slavery, that they can go to the land that I promised them. Well, Moses, having grew up in the royal court, <clears throat> knew that of his own authority with Pharaoh and with the Hebrew people, he couldn't just walk up and say, hey, y'all, <clears throat> let's go. Pharaoh, let us go. And so he asked God, he said, who shall I say sent me? They're going to ask by what authority are you coming to make these claims? And so God said to him there in Exodus, in that third chapter, he said, tell them, I am sent you. Tell them, I am sent you. I am who? I am what? What are you, what are you talking about, Moses? God makes another statement there. I am that I am. Now, that, sound, that, that sounds puzzling, and, and if you heard a person say that, you may question their ability to properly use English. You are what? I am. There's something that has to go with that. But when God says it, whatever is needed behind it, he is. He said, I'm the beginning and end, the Greek alpha and omega. I'm your help in time of trouble. I'm bread in the starving land. I, I'm whatever you need. I am. So that's who I'll say God is. So if I establish this thing where we're talking about faith and I want to have faith in God, I want you to know that God is whatever you need. He said, I am. He always has been. He always will be. So to establish this fact, God is God. We don't have to worry about him. Is he going to show up? Is, is he going to be able? Yes, he is. Will he show up when we want him? Possibly not. But when I was growing up, we used to always sing, he may not come when you want him. But he is always on time. God has proven himself time and time and time again. If you start with Adam and Eve and you go to Revelations, you will see God has been faithful. I hope in your life you've experienced his faithfulness. If you trust him, he will not let you down. He will not fail you. God is. God can do anything but fail. God can do anything but lie. What he's promised you, he will deliver on. In talking about this faith, then we are confident and establish the point that God is faithful. He's faithful to what he has said. He is faithful to do what he's going to do. He's faithful. But God also requires faith of us. 
My second point, God requires faith if of us in him. In our scripture reading, you heard it read there in Hebrews, the 11th chapter and the 6th verse, where it says, It is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that, he, that God exists and that he rewards those that sincerely seek him. Point one, anyone who wants to come to him must believe that he exists. If I didn't believe that alarm clock would work, it's worthless. I wouldn't put my money in. I wouldn't invest. It. I wouldn't lay down knowing I need to be at work or someplace at a certain time. And I'm depending on that clock to wake me up. If it didn't exist, how could I believe in it? The remote control. There's a lot going on there. I believe the batteries are good. I believe the electronics will work. I believe when I press that button, the change, the station will change. The volume will go up or down. Whatever I'm trying to accomplish will happen. I believe that. I have to. Or else why would I even pick it up? Why would I even try? I have to believe that. If you want God to be meaningful in your life, if you want him to be real, if you want him to work, you have to believe that God exists. Now, interesting, the Bible tells us not to call anyone a fool. Why? The scripture says a fool has said in his heart, there is no God. A fool, a person who does not have good sense, a person who is not exercising Good judgment does not believe there is a God. And therefore, there for them, there is no God. For them, they cannot come to him. For him, they don't even believe that he exists. But in order to have God in your life, in order to see him be what he said he would do, in order to see his faithfulness, you must believe. I'm reminded there of of Romans 10 and 9. The, the chapter and verse that I used, it speaks to what does it require for us to have salvation, to be saved. He says, we must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We must believe that he died for our sins. We must believe that God raised him from the dead on the third day. We must believe. That's what God requires of us to believe in him, to trust him. And we're going to talk about trust is faith in action. We must believe that he exists. If we don't, it is impossible to have work with him. It's impossible to expect anything. It's almost common sense, isn't it? If you don't believe something exists, then how is it going to do something for you? And so he says there, it is impossible to please God. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he is a rewarder, rewarder of those who diligently, that's King James, seeks him. What is it saying there? God doesn't want somebody, well, you know, uh, God, blah, 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 and, and then you expect, that's it. No, he wants you to seek after him. Because if you're seeking after him, you're going to learn about him. You're going to read and study your Bible. You're going to want to know all you know about it. On that remote control, don't you go through the channels to see what's there? Don't you look at the guide to see what's happening? And so if you seek him, then you're going to know more about him. And how do you do that? You do that by studying his word, knowing the Bible, spending time with him each and every day in prayer, in meditation, and in reading God's word. Do you remember the challenge that I offered you? I said there's some 1,440 minutes in a day. I'm challenging you to take 20 minutes to pray to God, faithfully, each and every day, to go to that place where you're not interrupted, where you're not torn away by things happening around you, where you can focus on God and pray to him, Thank him first for what he's done. Then pour out your heart to him. That's 20 minutes. Then take another 20 minutes to listen, to meditate, 
to listen to hear from God. You don't think about what you're going to do at the grocery store. You don't think about what's going to happen at work. Now, these things are going to flood your mind, but you just usher them out. You usher them aside and close the door and then come back in silence and in solitude to allow God to speak to you. And I said to you, he may not be audibly speaking to you at that moment, but as you go through your day, you're going to see him answering prayers. You're going to hear him. You're going to see him put things that you observe that you will know that he is active in your life. That's 30 minutes one day. And you know what? That still leaves you 1,000, I believe, uh, 20 or 10 minutes left as a small portion of our day. A small amount of time to give God for what we want of him. Don't you want his blessing each and every minute? Don't you want him guarding you and protecting you every second of your life? Don't you want him watching over your family and your loved ones? Don't you want him to provide for you? Then can't you spend 30 minutes in his presence? Can't you spend 20 minutes talking to him? Can't you spend 10 minutes to hear him? And what he has to say to you. Let me turn your attention to the, what we read there in our scripture reading. This comes from Hebrews. The 11th chapter. Often called the faith chapter. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But it says there in that first verse. Faith is the confidence. That what we hope for. Will actually happen. Faith. That's putting it in action. Faith is the confidence that we have that whatever we hope for will happen. It gives us assurance about the things we cannot see. Do you know the Bible tells us that if we can see it, that's not faith. If you can make it happen, that's not faith. Faith is believing God for what you cannot see. Faith is trusting God in that faith is in act. Trust is faith in action to trust God that he will care for you and protect you and trusting him. Faith must be put in action. It's the assurance we have. Then the third verse says, by faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. There's no argument for a Christian. Whether, whether the animals came first, the, the monkey came first. No, God spoke. He commanded the world in existence. That's our understanding by faith. And that what we now see did not come from anything that was seen. God spoke and said, let there be. And it is impossible to please God without faith. What does God require of us? He requires faith. That we trust him. That we believe in him. Because if I trust him, then just like I take that clock and put it on the stand and expect it to wake me up in the morning or sound. Then if I give my concerns to God, I'm going to trust him to hear and to answer my prayer. When I turn that alarm clock on and set it on the shelf, I don't sit there for another hour or the rest of the night. Is it going to go off? Am I going to wake up? No. I put that clock up there. I put my head down on the pillow. I close my eyes and then I go to dreamland. God wants us to trust him in that way. Give him the problem. Trust him to work it out. Don't worry about it. A good friend of mine says, if you're going to worry, don't pray. If you're going to pray, then don't worry. Trust God. That's what faith is about. Then finally, my third point, as Christians, what does it mean to be a Christian? It means that we walk by faith and not by sight. That was what we read there in that seventh verse. We walk by faith and not by sight. If I can see it, if I can do it myself, that's not faith in God. Are you willing to trust God for what you cannot make happen? 
Are you willing to trust God for what you cannot see? That takes something. If my child is in the hospital and doctors who are practicing medicine come up to me and say, I don't know what to do. We've done all we can. Am I going to have faith in God to trust him that he is able? If I lose my job and I look around me and see that the economy is in shambles and I know in a few weeks the rent or the mortgage is due, I know I need to buy clothes for my children. The car needs to be repaired. I have other obligations that I have to meet financially. Then will I have faith to trust God that he will provide? That he'll make a way? That he is able? Will I walk by faith and not sight? If, if, if these things are financially are, are challenging, and I have a few hundred thousand dollars in the bank. I may not worry about it. That's what I can do. That's not faith. That's what I can do. But when I can't do it, when I have to trust God, that requires faith. And God wants us to have faith in him. He will not fail you. He will not let you down. Can I say that also faith is in, in God is for how he works it out. Or I may say, God, look, I need you to do such and such, such, and I need you to do it like such and such. Mm -mm. I need to have faith in God that when I give him the problem, however he works it out, he's going to work it out. Didn't he say there in Romans in 3 and 28, all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose? If I love God, and I'm called by him. If I'm doing what he wants me to do, then whatever happens, it may not happen the way I want it to. But I can trust God that it's going to work out for my good. To walk by faith and not by sight. Can you do it? Can you trust God for what you cannot see and for what you cannot do? Yes. Yes, you can. Proverbs tells us, lean not to thine own understanding. Don't trust in what you can figure out, but in all your ways, acknowledge God and he will direct thy path. This may seem like absurd to you, but I grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And as I was growing up, I, there was an organ that my mother had purchased. And I took lessons on it. So I live in California now. I'm in the California uh, Army Reserve. Excuse me, the California. I'm in the reserves, the Air Force Reserve. And I take a trip home on one of the Air Force planes. It has a mission there and a base that was nearby. So I took it, went home, spent some time with my dad. The Lord had already called my mother home. And the organ was there. And I said, you know, I would really like to bring that organ back to California and begin taking lessons again so that I can play in the church. So McGuire Air Force Base was a couple hours away from where I lived in Philadelphia. It was 11 o'clock at night. In the morning, I had to head back to the base so that I could catch the airplane as it returned back to California. So I said, Lord, I would like to do this. It's 11 o'clock at night. I've been gone for a number of years, so I don't know anyone who has a truck. I don't know anyone who is willing to drive in the middle of the night to McGuire Air Force Base several hours away and then return. And then how am I going to get it on the airplane? I trusted God. I acted in faith. I went outside. I saw a young man who I did not know. I said, I need to get this organ to McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey. Would you help me take it there? He said, yes. Okay, we got the organ there. We're there, there on, 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 the, on, on, on the tarmac. I speak to the crew and say, I need to get this on the plane. Would you allow me to take it back home? They said, yes. 
Then I had to find personnel that had the equipment who were willing to lift it up in the airplane. I did. God made a way. I, I, went, I didn't just stand there and say, oh, good. But I trusted God and took action. I'm not talking about how great I am, but the fact is about trusting God. Well, guess where that, that organ wound up? It wound up in California with me. That's just one extraordinary example that I can give you about trusting God. What about in your own life? Do you have an example that you trusted God? You stretched out in faith on something that you could not see, you could not control, but you did something. You didn't just stand there in the corners, twiddling your thumbs, say, oh, 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 but say, Lord, this is the situation. And then move out in faith. In the 11th chapter of Hebrews, many call this the hall of fame of people who have faith. And in here, it lists several people that did things that were extraordinary, that demonstrated their faith in God. Were there some supreme or supernatural beings? No, they were everyday people, but they trusted God. For example, Abraham. God told him, I want you to go to another land. And when you go there, I will bless you. I will make a way for you. And I will cause your family to be so numerous that it will be more than the stars in the sky, more than the sand pebbles there on, on the beach. And, and Abraham trusted God and he left his home. That was an unusual thing. You didn't leave the family compound to go someplace you have no idea where you're going. But Abraham trusted God. God told Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. Here's Abraham at the time, 90 years old, his wife about 10 years younger, Sarah. And if you know anything about human biology, people don't parent children at that age. But they trusted God. They believed in what he said, that he, what he said that he would do, that he would do it. And they waited. They waited over 10 years for God to fulfill his promise to him. Are you willing to wait? Are you going to trust him that long? Part of this story includes where Sarah said, well, you know, Abraham has kind of been a long time. Why don't we do this thing over here and, and help God out? No, God doesn't need our help. And when we try to help him, we're going to make a mess. That's what Sarah did. But God kept his word. And at the appointed time, they gave birth to a son. They trusted him. Then God father tested Abraham. He said, now take your son Isaac and I want you to offer him as a sacrifice to me. Abraham was obedient. He built the altar. He put the wood there. And as he was about to carry out the charge that God had given him, God said, Abraham, stay your hand. Don't do the child any harm. For there's a ram over there in the bush. Use that. Are we willing to trust God for things that could be painful for us? Are we willing to trust God when life does not go the way that we want it to? Are we willing to trust God when people walk out of our life who promised that they would be there until we die? Are, are you willing to trust God when it hurts, when tears are are brought to your eyes when you see how things are playing out? Will you trust him to do what he said that he would do? I trust him. In my mind, I have no choice but to trust him. I cannot control things. I cannot control people, but God can. And I trust him to provide what I need. If I don't have it, I'm going to trust him to say I don't need it. If he gives me a Pinto and I would like to have a Cadillac, I'm going to trust him because he gave me that because that's what I need. There are others in this hall of fame. There was Noah. There was Noah who God said, build an ark. It hadn't rained for hundreds of years. Noah, and it is, as, as the comedian said, is in his driveway, building an ark. And the neighbor said, oh, no, well, what is that? It's an ark. 
What's an ark? I don't know, but God told me to build it. I'm building it. And what are you going to do? I'm going to get two of every kind of animal and put it on, on the ark. And then it's going to rain. Okay. It hasn't rained for hundreds of years, Noah. Everything's okay between you and the missus? And you feeling all right? But he had faith in God. I, I use humor, but he trusted God. When those around him said, no, nah, this doesn't make sense. But through his faith, he saved his family and humankind. And to show God's promise, the rainbow that we see in the sky, God said, no more water, but fire next time. And every time you see that rainbow, you see the sign of my covenant and my promise. Will you trust God? for what you cannot see? Will you trust God for what you cannot do? To do so is to walk by faith. Amos 3 and 3, if I'm correct, says, how can two walk together unless they agree? If you trust God, if you have faith in him, then you will, you will be able to walk in faith. To walk in faith says, I'm not going to allow myself to worry about it. No matter what it looks like, the situation looks like, no matter what people say, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to put my faith in him. I might trust in him. My brothers and sisters, he will not let you down. He will not disappoint you. He's faithful to his word. He doesn't change. He was here before we got here and he'll be here after we're gone. He has that kind of longevity. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He's concerned about every thought that you have, every worry you have in your life. He knows about it. But he wants you to trust him, to talk to him. Say, Lord, I'm giving this to you, and I trust you. If you will trust him, if you will believe him, I can guarantee you that he will not let you down. Not in the long run. But if you trust him, he will make a way. I can give you other stories. They may not be as, as, as significant to you as they are to me. They may, may seem like small things. But oh, I, I think about the psalmist says, I was once young, but now I'm old. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken. God didn't turn his back on them. He didn't let them down. He, the psalmist goes on to say, nor their seed begging bread. Will you trust God? Will you put all of your faith in him? If you do, he will never disappoint you. But he'll be there. If you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit lives in you. What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to walk by faith? It means trust God and every aspect of your life. The Bible says that in order to please God, in order to have faith, you must first believe there is a God. Now just because you don't believe doesn't mean there is not a God. He's real. He's real, my brothers and sisters. But I hope that as you hear Jesus speaking to you, if you have not made him a part of your life, that you will open up your heart to him, that you will repent of your sins and invite him into your life. Jesus says, if you will believe, he will come and he'll be with you. And with him, he gives us the Holy Spirit, God in us, a, who is there as a deposit, a guarantee to say, I'm there. I will never leave you nor will I forsake you, but I'll be with you always, even until the end of the age. If you have not accepted Jesus in Lord, as your Lord and Savior, would you join with me in this prayer to invite him into your life? Dear Lord, I repent of my sins. Come into my life. I give you full control. I make you my Lord and Master. 
I will obey you. I receive the salvation that you will give me. I receive the Holy Spirit in my life who will always be there, who will be my advocate to God, who will be my intercessor to you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you because I believe that you're the son of God. Because I believe you died for my sins. And because you rose from the dead, I am saved. Thank you, Lord. If you have prayed that prayer in sincerity, you're saved. You're saved from the second death. You will always have fellowship and union with God. Hell is not your home. You have a God that loves you and it will always be with you through thick and thin, up and down, good or bad. He's there and he will always make a way for you. And he always has outstretched arms to hear you when you come to him in prayer. May God bless you. I congratulate you. And ask, won't you let me know that you've made this wonderful decision? I'd love to share with you. I'd love to encourage you. If you live in our area, in Arlington, Virginia, in the Washington metro area, I pray that you'll seek us out, that you'll become a member of our church, because the next important step is that you become a member of a Bible-based, a Bible-believing, a Bible-teaching church, because that's how you will learn to understand this better, how you will understand and know what God wants of you so that when he returns, you will be fully prepared and ready. There on our website is my contact information. I hope you'll reach out to me. If you do not live in our area, I'll be glad to assist you to find a church. Think about these two things. The Bible tells us to not neglect not to forsake to assemble together. That's an instruction to Christians. Then think about this. If we were not supposed to be a part of the church, why did Jesus create it? He created it because that's a place where Christians come together to grow, to learn, and to be better servants of what God wants us to be. Let us pray our benediction. Father, we thank you that you love us and you care for us. You care for us so much that you gave your only son to die for the things that we have done wrong. But he had done no sin whatsoever. We thank you, Lord, that you care for us so much that you're always present there in our life. You see what's going on. And yes, we have trials and tribulations in this world. Things that come at us that we don't like. Things happen that are sometimes very painful and hurtful. But you said that you would be there with us. And you said that you would bring us through. That you would give us victory. You would give us peace. You would give us joy. And you would give us happiness. Let us always trust you. And as we leave this assembly together, we know that we never leave your presence. Thank you for who you are and what you are. Help us to believe in you wholeheartedly and not doubt. I pray these prayers in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. May God bless you and may God keep you.